Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please rise as we welcome the academic procession inside the venue. You may be seated. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here. In particular, I would like to welcome our Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, for Social Impact Transformation and Personnel, Professor Nico Koopman. Thank you very much for making the time. Um, very importantly, our first honorary speaker, Professor Sharki Grolaar. Thank you for being here. Also her husband, Eduan Nudia, and their young children, Hugo and Alexa, in their absence. Saibrand and Susan Grobelaar, who are the parents of Professor Grobelaar. Welcome, thank you for being here. Amanda Nudia, who is the mother-in-law of Sarki. Thank you for being here. Um, she's attending online, sorry, I'm looking in the wrong spot. <laughs> uh, we also have the sister and brother-in-law of Professor um, Grobelaar here, Hanli and the two escapers. Thank you for attending. Um, <clears throat> and then her brother Herman Grobelaar and sister-in-law Liesel Grobelaar, who's also attending online. Thank you for making the time. And other in-laws, Gordon and Theo. Sharon and their kids, Avalon and Jordan, thank you also for being here today. Then our second very important honorary speaker is Professor Christy Dorfling. On his behalf, I would like to welcome his wife, Andri, and their children, Imke and Clara. Thank you. You look beautiful. And then also his parents, Christy and Charlotte Dorfling. Thank you for being here. Lastly, very importantly, I also would like to welcome our own colleagues from the Department of Industrial Engineering, where um, Professor Groblar is from, and the Department of Chemical Engineering, and also our other departments um, from the Faculty of Engineering. And in particular, I would like to welcome uh, one of our previous deans who's here today, and I don't see him, but Professor Hansi Knutze, welcome. Thank you. Still don't see him, <laughs> but welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, also all the friends and collaborators and students and everyone else who's att attending both in person and online. Thank you for prioritizing this um, in your busy days. Uh, then I would like to remind you, if you haven't done so yet, to just switch off your cell phone, please. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Sara Krobler. You can, you're welcome to come and stand here while I introduce you. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering at Stellenbosch University, and she's a research associate at the University Center for Research on Evaluation, Science, and Technology. She's also registered as a professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa. Her academic journey includes an uh, MPhil in technology policy from the University of Cambridge and, a, and degrees in electric, electronic engineering um, and computer engineering from the University of Pretoria, where she also obtained her PhD in engineering management. In addition, Professor Grobelaar holds a postgraduate diploma in monitoring and evaluation methods from Stellenbosch University. She teaches technology management preparing students to navigate and lead in the complex interplay between technology and business. And her research focuses on innovation systems and innovation for inclusive development with a view to create strategies that foster inclusive growth across Africa. Prof. Kroblar is deeply interested in systems analysis, systems thinking, strategy, and the management and innovation of technology. 
And I know also that she has an extensive network of collaborators, not only in South Africa, but also nationally, and I assume also uh, that several of them are attending online, so let me sneak in a last little welcome again. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sir. Well, thank you so much. Um, when I was preparing for this lecture, I realized that I'm going to run out of time uh, before I run out of material. So I decided to start with the most important part of um, recognizing people that helped me along my journey. It's quite a milestone for me to be here. And first of all, I would really like to, to thank my family. They've already been welcomed, <laughs> but I would like to thank them as well. Edouan, my husband, my kids, Ichna, Alexi, they're four and six, so they're definitely not invited today. Um, my parents, Seibrand and Susan, my brothers, uh, Bertus and Herman, and my sister, Anli, and then all my in-laws. And in our family, we know the in-laws are the nice people in our family. Uh, thank you so much for um, keeping up with the Grobelaars. And then my friends, I've invited basically everybody I know. <laughs> and thank you so much for attending. I see a lot of the, you guys here, and I'm sure we're going to celebrate a lot um, tonight. My students and colleagues, I want to actually put in one big category. There's basically not a colleague in my department that I have not collaborated with or had intense um, interactions with. And the same with my students. Nothing that I'm going to tell you about today was done on my own. I do have a process and a approach of collaboration. And uh, it's, it, it's really um, not on my own. Uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot have a big program and be productive if you work on your own. And I will allude to some names, but I decided not to name people when I speak about projects, just because it's, I will definitely neglect some of the very important contributors, and I do not intend to do that. And then, of course, the management of our faculty. Uh, thank you so much for creating a positive, supportive environment where we can be really productive. I know you have all the problems all the time, but you need the recognition that you are creating a fantastic place where we can do our best work. So thank you so much for that. Now, you must have seen the... What is happening? Wrong, top, wrong button. Okay, so you must have seen the title of my talk. It's about creating a future through innovation for inclusive development. So if a person dedicates her life to this topic, uh, I think it, it deserves a little bit of a background on why I think this is worthwhile to work on. So we, we live in a very unfair world. Already in 2015, Oxfam reported that 50% of wealth is only in 1% of people's hands. And this is only one indicator that shows how inequalities are increasing. Um, there's an intensive um, concentration of capital and a, a, a very big majority of people uh, become more and more marginalized through poverty. And why is inequality not a good thing? If a small group of people have power and all the wealth in their hands, there is no way that, that the majority can be served and that more people can benefit from economic development. Uh, and also, the world is really, really unfair to its poor people. They face what we call the poverty penalty or double jeopardy, and that refers to the high cost that poor individuals need to incur to participate in a market economy. So, a person who's poor may have to forego a whole day's pay to go and stand in a long queue at the clinic, stand in the clinic, get to the front, and either see that this, the medicines they need are not there, or it could even be an expired. So it means that poor people have to pay more and disproportionately invest more to have only the basic services. Also, this may mean that people will end up in non-access and non-usage. You will not even bother to go to the clinic because you know that you're not going to get the services that you need. And this, of course, is true for many other pro um, um, products and services that poor people try to access. Also, um, if you really ha are resource constrained, you have to make tough decisions about what you will spend your money on. 
So we call it the catastrophic spending burden. You may have to choose between medical treatment for a family member versus having a kid in school. And you would may wonder then, but why does the private sector not step in here? Is there not an opportunity? And the problem is, yes, for some products, it's possible to, to reach the, the, the penetration that you need in a market to operate um, profitably, but very, very few products actually um, will, will be successfully scaling because there are many infrastructure issues and skills challenges. Now, I was hugely influenced by two Dutch academics that used to come to Stenbosch quite frequently when I was working for Crest. Uh, the first person was uh, Robert Tyson, and the second person is Ari Rupp. And they sensitized me to the idea of not working just on traditional innovation, but to get innovation for inclusive development or frugal innovation. So it's a very interesting challenge that they posed and say, what about a grand societal experiment? We live in a country where we have first world infrastructures in many areas. We have a sophisticated economy, we have a strong financial sector, universities, competitive companies, but we also have a lot of people that are excluded from economic activity. So companies struggle to serve the base of the pyramid, which is a term that the poorest four billion people in the world is often referred to. Um, and also aid organizations try to, to make a difference in poor, economy, uh, in poor environments. But very frequently, these interventions are pilot projects. And very frequently, it's people coming from a completely different context, <coughs> parachuting into this environment that we don't really understand the complex ecologies and ecosystems where changes need to happen. So what we want to work on, and what we've been working on for the past almost 10 years, is around creating a future for inclusive innovation, or innovation for inclusive development. Uh, we use these terms interchangeably. But inclusive innovation is the improvement of living conditions and the creation of employment opportunities for the, through the development of new products, <coughs> services, processes, and business models. And it means that we cannot just, at the end, have solutions looking for problems. It's about the whole process of innovation that has to be integrated through this philosophy. And I can name a few examples. Jaipur foot is a prosthesis. Normally a prosthesis can cost $5,000, $10,000. This prosthesis costs $5. It's a frugal innovation. It's stripped from many features, but it has a basic function. Unjani Clinics is a business model innovation. This is a network of private clinics. They set, they set up in resource constrained environments. The idea here is to decant the pressure from the healthcare system. And the idea is that um, they serve a segment of the market where people can pay a little bit of money for, uh, uh, for going to legal aid. There are about 120 of these clinics in South Africa. They have successfully scaled. They continue to try to do so. A stock visibility system, it was rolled up to 3,400 clinics in South Africa to log the stock levels of clinics because there was no visibility of especially the clinics where there's no computer connectivity or computers or internet connectivity. Now, I always present this quite complicated graph or figure to explain our approach. Now, at, at level one, there are the actual innovation projects that are developed. We don't do that. We don't make innovations or technologies or things. We work on level two. This schematic is to show interaction between components. We take a systems perspective. We try to create <coughs> lenses and mechanisms so that we can analyze how these systems work. We don't look at innovation as a technology or a, a service. We look at it as a system where it has to be integrated, how it is created. And what we invest a lot of time in is to sharpen these tools that we can look at systems and understand how they work. And surely then, if we have these lenses that we've refined, we're in a position to go and look at innovation projects to see what works, under what conditions, and why. 
And this helps us also to understand when we look at systems, where are the weaknesses? How can we improve systems? And of course, at the uh, level four then, we can start to make more generalized recommendations about how to support innovation. This number five on the side is from way back when I worked in the social sciences for three years. We don't touch the theories of policy change and engineering. We can only get in trouble. So in my, in my group, we have a number of core themes. I'm going to neglect quite a few of them today. I'm not going to talk about our work in users in innovation, for instance. I'm not going to talk about One Health. But I'm going to talk more about how we try to understand innovation. How do we try to see how can innovations make a difference? Now, we have three main focus areas, but inevitably other things um, pop up and usually we are very curious people and take that on. But three focus areas in our program, access to education, food, and healthcare. It's really not a secret about the inequalities in education in South Africa. Access to food. Food inflation is 18% at the moment for a basket of fresh food and meat. I don't know a person who's getting 18% increases. So it, it is a huge, huge burden on poor families when food inflation is this high. 28 million people in South Africa rely on grants. This, this is not a lot of money. By the second, third, fourth week, they are very vulnerable. South Africans go to bed hungry. And then access to healthcare, we know that if you don't have medical aid, you are going to struggle to get quality healthcare. Of course, there's a lot of statistics and proof behind it, but that's not the purpose. What I would like to talk about next is the level two work we're doing. I would like to show you what we're doing so that we can understand innovation systems. What are we doing that we can look at the system and understand what is happening there? Why is this working? How is this pilot project evolving? Why didn't it scale? So this is the work that we focus a lot of our attention on. Now, there are three frameworks we use in our program. Ecosystems, value chain, and innovation systems. Today, I'm talking about the innovation systems framework. It's the most dominant work in our, in our program. Now, a system is defined as different components that condition and constrain each other to its common purpose. That is the general definition of a, of a system. An innovation system is a system that develops and diffuses innovations. And the components that condition and constrain each other or the structural aspects of the system. So what you can see here uh, on the left-hand side are the structural aspects. Actors or the different participants. It could be academics, business people, finance people. The interactions are very important. They develop networks. They develop knowledge and learning and share information about innovations. The institutions is actually incredibly important in terms of the way that innovation systems work. Institutions or the rules of the game. So there are hard institutions, which would be regulations, it would be laws, it would be things like that. Very, very important in area like medical devices or in medicine. Um, or soft institutions like culture. We all know that Silicon Valley is famous for its very entrepreneurial culture. These things are really important in, in, the, in creating the character of innovation systems. And then, of course, infrastructure, uh, roads, financial infrastructure, social infrastructure. But for a long time, studies that used the innovation system perspective was, were very, very descriptive. So it would say, there are so many universities, they're publishing so many papers, they have so many patents. And it was describing the system, but it wasn't analyzing the dynamics of the system. I was never quite sure what to do with those articles when I read them. But a lot of people have been trying to refine this framework and to start to look at how the system's functions um, can, can be analyzed. And these functions include entrepreneurial activity, knowledge development, diffusion, guidance of search, how we decide where to allocate resources, market formation, mobilization of resources, and creation of legitimacy. Now, this is a framework. A framework is not a theory, a framework is not a model. 
it tells us what are the elements that could be important, but it doesn't tell us much if we look at a specific case or if we look at a specific, in a specific innovation. So we are using this framework to develop tools that we can analyze innovation. And I'm going to talk about two of them very briefly. The first tool is event history analysis. It comes from the political scientists, and it's about how do we map the history of innovation projects over time? How can we analyze how it started and how it moved through different phases of innovation? It helps us understand how the capacities and capabilities in innovation systems develop. These innovation capabilities are built up at a very high cost over time. It's not something that just pops up. It's important to understand those elements. And a third tool I'm referring to is where we take a snapshot. If you look at the different functions and what the whole sector says they find easy and difficult to do, it provides advice around to support all sectors. Now, what, is a, what does the event history analysis look like? Now, we've got these functions, but now we want to analyze a project. What did it was to, with a lot of work between many students, to start to unpack activity statements that would constitute the performance of functions. So I'm going to give you one example because it has the fewest bullets on this list, the creation of legitimacy. The creation of legitimacy is to create legitimacy of using certain technologies. So it could be lobbying activities, it could be advice, it could be more formalized processes like advocacy coalitions. And what we now do is we take the history, for instance, of how a whole innovation evolved and we identify important events of how this happened. And what we can do then is to start to identify, identify or recognizable activities from a framework of unpacking the functions. And this helped us to start to unpack the whole evolution of how innovation projects happen. So very simply put, some of these, and it's, it's just illustrative, uh, this was of an e-wallet system that was rolled out uh, to farmers in Nigeria. And we could look at the different stages of the, th this project, positive and negative events. That, that happened in, this, in, in, the, in the system. And also this red bit that becomes brighter and brighter is the cumulative effect. We keep on adding how many functions happened or how many events happened in that function. It helps us to see what functions are important at what stages. We can also do it for actors. We can see what actors were involved at what stages, what were their roles. Uh, we can look at different phases of the project. What are the actors doing? This was then further developed by Meraki Matteo, who is now working on ICT for uh, education projects. And we are taking it a step further. When we look at these pilot projects, people come in, they start to implement a project, they are a champion. Over time, they need to engage the community, they need to engage all kinds of other actors, and these roles need to be created, and people need to fulfill them, and we can, when we start to unpack these histories of the cases, see where do these things fall around. The champion role is usually the reason the project ceases to exist or the funding runs out. So this is how we try to create insight into how these pilot projects or other projects evolve. And what is very useful is we can also apply it on a sectoral level. We've applied it on an additive manufacturing sector. Uh, we're working with Professor Natasha Sachs, and she works on hard metals. And we could tell the story about how the whole additive manufacturing sector evolved over time. Over time, how did, how did the country have more and more uh, additive manufacturing systems, but also through which functions did it happen? The same student, Michelle Smith, she was McClellan, she's now Smith, looked at cases. And I said I was not going to mention names, but now I did. Anyway, <laughs> um, but what she also did was we looked at case studies of innovation in additive manufacturing, and we can look at how the idea moves from uh, the lab through different stages of innovation, as you can see at the top, to design, testing, commercialization, and market expansion and growth. 
And what we now can start to look at is there are points in every project where there are barriers that need to be overcome or valleys of death. And we can use event history analysis to analyze the dynamics of how people overcome valleys of death. If we can build large enough databases with enough case studies, we can start to theorize around this. We can use this to understand the fundamentals of how patient projects can be better supported. We are applying this also in a survey um, um, format. We can ask 80% of the industry, which functions do you find important and difficult? It has policy implications. So to have unpacked a framework into activity statements has have many, many uses. I'm super excited also now with the opportunities we have to, to expand using these techniques. We're going to use it in more traditional innovation sectors like medical devices, medical diagnostics, rail components, automotive components, energy, and, and we've already applied it in additive manufacturing. We are starting a collaboration with UCT Medtech around that. Uh, the DSI NRF Center of Excellence provided funding for the additive manufacturing project, and we've recently started the project with Leibniz University, Hanover, and the India Institute of Technology, Madras, basically the MIT of India, with a professor who is very, very good at building frugal innovations. So I'm super excited about that. And then this piece of work doesn't completely fit in with my work, but I always want to talk about it because I think it's the work that had the most impact. Uh, I co-supervised a student with Tinas Poison, uh, Jason Samuels, and with his PhD, he could show how we can save money in schools by um, in, uh, installing smart meters and changing changing the lights to LED lightning and doing all kinds of other interventions. And Jason was actually successful in um, spinning out the company GreenX and the company is now entering into a growth phase and I'm so proud of Jason. Thanks Jason. It's very good to see people not uh, uh, getting a degree and then to go and work for a bank or something to go and use their, their research. It's so good to see it. Another very exciting project um, is where it started last year with a professor, Miguel Passion, from Gothenburg University and Chalmers. He is also a person who builds innovation, and they built this scanning technology that can help with triage for, um, for stroke. And it's super expensive to have CAT scan, uh, CD scanners. This is far, far cheaper. And what we're trying to understand from our perspective is how do we help to, un to unpack how technology procurement is happening in the private and public sector by considering technologies for which very little clinical evidence is already available. It's called early technology assessment. And I'm very, very optimistic about how we can contribute to this. And then one of the biggest thralls of my career this far is that um, the I Keep It Cool project, which was funded by the Flemish government, and, and our collaborating partner was Impact Licensing Initiative. Um, the signing ceremony, uh, I put the photo there because this tall man, um, third from left, um, his name is Jan Bon, and he was the minister president of Flanders at the time, he's still actually, and it was the first time that the head of state comes and helps sign our research agreements. But I think they were here for many other reasons too. Um, but it was, it, we've been receiving visits from officials a few times and trying to, s to share good news stories about our project. And what it was about is to look at technology transfer. How do we look at, the, this is the box that you see there, it's a vaccine carrier. And the idea is that it, it, um, it's a passive cold chain technology. If you charge it, it can stay cold for three weeks without being connected to anything. And the idea was to fit it out with IT. And if you can show that, yes, the vaccines arrived somewhere in good condition, and we know where it is, it enables outcome-based models for vaccine delivery. This has spun out into more work in our, in our group to look at more generally how can we support outcome-based delivery models in healthcare. So it's not that easy, because the moment you say, okay, let's pay for when you deliver something in somebody's arm, uh, you think, okay, but there are many things that you can't control. So it's a very complicated process to put together partnerships and contracts 
where these, these, these agreements can actually be closed, and it's very complicated, and, and uh, I've got a PhD student working on that. They wanted to look at fr fr social franchising models to see if we can get local people to provide um, uh, culture and services and uh, digital infrastructure, because if you want to track and see where things are and only pay when something is delivered, you need to have very, very solid digital infrastructure. I, I've alluded to the stock visibility system earlier, and, and I was contemplating if to include it or not, but it was such an important part of our work for a long time that I decided to just mention that by using a simple, well, it's not that simple, it's difficult to implement this across clicks in a very uh, consistent way, but just by knowing stock levels a little bit better, we could see if we can develop all kinds of concept demonstrators to use this data to show if we can um, predict stockouts better. And we also did a project for the Department of Health to see if we could show that the stock visibility solution did indeed help. Because obviously you can't count stockouts because we see them now better. So that's not how you would look at it. We looked at supply chain resilience. How long does it take to resolve stockouts? I've alluded to the Unjani project, but I think the important part of this project was the influence of the program to start to think more about social franchising as a mechanism. So uh, we, we had work from a, from a master's student who looked at using um, complex adaptive systems as a basis to consider how do we duplicate successful interventions across different locations. It's very difficult because it may work in one place, but if you want to go and duplicate it somewhere else, it's not that easy. We also have a student working on, let's say you have a social franchise or, or um, your social franchise, how do we pick the next location? Bionic well, Clinics has 20, 120 clinics all over Africa, South Africa. They are interested in expanding the operations, but where should they put the next clinic? So we've got some projects around that. And given the issues that we know um, to, to take pilot projects to, to scale, uh, the enterprise and entrepreneurship element in our program I think is very, very promising. So uh, social enterprises have uh, hybrid attention. It's a tension between uh, economic feasibility and then social impact. And it's quite difficult for organizations to manage that. So we're working on uh, management frameworks and tools to, to help negotiate that, and also uh, how does one establish social franchises, because that seems to be a quite effective scaling uh, mechanism. My last project that I'll talk about is Food Forward South Africa. I was very lucky in 2022 to visit MIT, and I started working with Chris Mechia, and um, I wanted to expand the access to food part of our program. And we started to look at two things, wholesale food, wholesale food markets and food banks. And I was so surprised to see that the biggest and the best food bank is here in Cape Town. So um, I contacted the, the CEO, um, Andy Duplessis, and we started to collaborate. And we have a, a long, uh, hopefully a long-standing collaboration, and they're supporting a postdoc now. We're helping them to show the social impact of their work, to look at carbon credits. Maybe they can start to uh, get carbon credits for, for um, savings and create uh, income stream for, for their charity because it's a charity. And then they have given us all their transaction data. Um, it's a wonderful thing for researchers to have uh, operations transaction data. So there are so many modeling if, um, efforts in our program at the moment around that. And then a project that we've started just now with MIT and um, uh, Monterey Tech, which is the MIT of Mexico, and Tasha's University. I went on their website. It looks beautiful. Um, lots of water, and, and I definitely think um, that is a place to visit. And we hope to, in the wholesale food market, food market um, aspect, uh, look at infrastructure in, in food markets and also how we can look at the maturity of infrastructure in food markets. Most fresh food that people access 
if it's not through retailers, it's through fresh fruit markets. And then, last but not least, I have a new hobby. Uh, I've started to write uh, illustrated children's books for my kids for my kids in my coffee breaks and lunch breaks. So um, if you look at these two characters on the slides, it's very, very accurate what they are like as people. Yuhu is a budding engineer, and Alexi is a superhero. And the intention here is that I give them stories where they use their talents to, to improve the world and do something good. Um, but there are many mistakes when you use uh, generative AI to get consistency between all the figures, and maybe the storyline is always not so great, but I'm relying on it. And the intention, of course, is to, to raise uh, people that will make a difference, but the unintended consequence was I'm also raising very critical reviewers. And, <laughs> and we may one day find them useful. <laughs> so yes, thank you for listening. And uh, thank you for the moment and that, that you shared this with me. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, can we get rid of? Okay. <laughs> so I would like to introduce our next um, speaker, our um, very own Professor Christy Dorfling. He started his career uh, as an engineer at um, the Measurement and Control Division at Mintec, and that was after he obtained his Bachelor's in Engineering um, in Chemical Engineering from Salamash University. That was in 2005. And he went on to complete his MPhil um, in Advanced Chemical Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And he came back to us to do his PhD um, that he completed in 2012. And he's been appointed as a full-time academic in the Department of Chemical Engineering since 2009. Um, so he's been doing double duty, finishing a PhD and teaching and everything. Um, his research interests in the field of hydrometallurgy include the characterization and model of leaching systems, the recovery of base and precious metals from leach solutions, and the development of processes for metal recovery from low-grade ores and secondary resources. And this has a lot of industry application, so I know that he's got a lot of industry collaborations. Professor Dorfling has supervised three PhDs and 37 research master students to completion and he's also previously served as undergraduate program coordinator in his department and he's currently serving as the chair of his department so he also carries a significant management burden. So I am very proud to have Christy here and to have him in our professoriate so please over to you Christy. Thank you very much, Professor Fulhun. Um, good evening, Professor Koopman, members of the Faculty Management Committee, colleagues, students, family and friends. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give you an overview of some of my research activities in the field of hydrometallurgical extraction of metals from primary and secondary resources. And I want to start the talk by unpacking uh, one or two of the words or terms in the title, and first and foremost, the idea of hydrometallurgy. So when we talk about hydrometallurgy, what does it mean? And I want to sort of take one step back to my training as a chemical engineer and say when I speak to first years and I need to explain what chemical engineers do, then I usually use this diagram saying a chemical engineer is responsible for the design, the construction, the operation, and the optimization of a large-scale process that allows us to produce a high-value product from a low-value feedstock or a low-value raw material. In the context of my research, we can expand that and say your low-value feedstock 
will typically be ore that you dig out of the ground, and there you will have, let's say, two to five grams of gold or platinum per ton of rock. And what we eventually want to produce is a high-value metal product, and that could be the metal itself, or it could be a metal containing compound. And the processes that we use to get from our low-value feedstock to the high-value end product can broadly be categorized into three categories, physical processing, hydrometallurgy, and pyrometallurgy. Right? And when we talk about physical processing, that process, if we've got mineral of interest that's got physical properties that's significantly different than the physical properties of the valueless mineral, then we can use separation techniques such as magnetic separation or density separation to separate those minerals. If, however, we need to alter the chemical structure of the minerals, then we need an extractive metallurgical process, which will either be pyrometallurgy, and that's where we heat the rocks to very high temperatures and then change properties based on phase transformations at high temperatures, or we can use what we call hydrometallurgy. And that's where our focus will lie today. What do we mean when we talk about hydrometallurgy? Hydrometallurgy is effectively the use of water-based or aqueous systems to extract the metals of interest from the minerals. So usually we will start with a solid feedstock, it could be your ore, and that will typically go into a first stage what we will call leaching, and in the leaching process we want to dissolve the solid or selectively dissolve some of the solids in our feedstock. And that then gives us a solution that contains dissolved metals, and in that solution, we again want to separate and recover those metals. And there we use solution purification techniques such as solvent extraction, ion exchange, precipitation. And in some cases, we take that further to a metal production step. All right, so with that as context, I'm going to move on to the idea of primary and secondary resources, which is the second sort of important term in the title. If we look at the mining industry, it's for a very long time followed quite a linear economic model where we start with ore, which is a natural resource, and that is what will be classified as our primary resource. And that will then typically undergo some form of physical processing to do preliminary separation of minerals of interest from valueless minerals. And that gives us what we call the concentrate. Now, to go from the concentrate to the metals, we will usually require chemical transfer of minerals, and that is why hydrometallurgy comes into play. So hydrometallurgy really is important to go from concentrates to metals, right? And once we've produced the metals or the metal-containing compounds, then we can use that to produce a range of different products, photovoltaic cells, cell phones, batteries, whatever the case might be, that is the application of what we produce at the end of the day. The reality is that during these processes, so when we produce metals from concentrates and when we produce products from metals, there's a lot of waste material being generated, which I simply call scrap this diagram. And then the other reality that we need to realize is that the products that get produced have got a finite lifetime. And sometimes that lifetime is relatively short. If we think about a cell phone, for example, it could be two to five years when that device has reached its end of life and it goes into storage or it goes onto a landfill site. If we think about the contained value in the scrap and in the end of life products and of the material that might have already ended up in landfill sites, then one can start to understand why there's globally a drive towards what they call the circular economy, saying that these materials need to be recycled, need to be reprocessed, and we need to recover the metals from those materials in order to make sure that this go, does not go to waste. And these components are what we refer to as our secondary metal resources. Inevitably, there will be some losses in this processing. So to process scrap back to metals, there are thermodynamic limitations, so it will not ever be an entirely closed loop, and secondary production will never replace primary production, but secondary production has got an important place to play from an environmental management and economic perspective. 
Right, with that as background, I will talk a bit about research in the field of primary metal production, and I'm going to do it in the context of platinum group metal or PGM production, um, because it encapsulates quite a lot of the research work that I've done, and to a large extent, that's also where my research career started. It was around September 2008 when I applied for a position at Stellenbosch University, and I had virtually no research experience um, at that stage. But I was aware of the fact that the department was looking for somebody who will pursue research in hydrometallurgy because uh, Prof. Leon Lorenzen at that time had just left the department. And I thought, it's a great opportunity. Soon after I received the offer of employment, the next big question was, what is the PhD topic going to be? Right, and I received an email from, from Andre Berger with a list of probably 12 topics that the former colleague, Jacques Ekstien, had sent to him. And Jacques at that stage was at Lonman, now Sabanya Stillwater. And Lonman, Sabanya Stillwater, is in the business of platinum production. So that's where the platinum comes into the story. So if we look at platinum production from a very high level, then we will start with what we call the run of mine ore, so that's the material you take out of the ground. It goes through a comminution circuit where we break the rocks into smaller rocks to liberate the minerals that we are interested in. There's some physical separation steps to produce the concentrate. The concentrate goes through furnace and converter. We remove some of the silicates and oxides and some of the excess iron and sulfur. And then we get what we call the converter mat, and this converter mat then goes into a hydrometallurgical circuit where my interests lie. So I'm going to look at the hydrometallurgical circuit in a bit more detail and sort of understand the function of the different unit operations. The important thing to realize here is that this converter mat that enters the hydrometallurgical circuit consists essentially of platinum group metals that are dispersed or embedded in a matrix of nickel sulfide and copper sulfide minerals. And we want the platinum group metals. So in this process, there's a leaching stage. So remember, that's where we dissolve stuff. And in this context, the first leaching stage is where we want to dissolve the nickel sulfides. So we want to dissolve nickel sulfides. It gives us a solution that contains nickel. It allows us to produce a nickel sulfate product. And the solid stream goes into a second and third leaching stage. And in the second and third leaching stage, we want to dissolve the copper sulfides. So that we only have the PGMs left in our solid residue. And then we can produce our copper cathodes. And we've got a PGM concentrate that can go for further refining. So, getting back to my start of employment at university, before I joined here in January 2009, I was still working at Mintec, and I visited Jacques at his office in Lonman, in Johannesburg, and we were talking about these potential projects that they had proposed, and at some stage, he draws sort of a very rough schematic of, of an autoclave on the whiteboard in his office, and he asked me, can we model this reactor? Can we predict dynamically what is going to happen in this reactor? And it sounded like a really interesting challenge. And that's what we decided on as a PhD project. So to be able to do that, what you need to understand is what is the effect of operating conditions or process variables on the chemistry in the system? What are your reaction mechanisms? What are the reaction rates? And once you've got that, then you can combine that with conservation equations to model the system. So during the first four years of my employment at Stellenbosch University, I spent quite a bit of time with this high pressure leaching vessel, generating experimental data required to complete the PhD. And sort of what we saw at a very high level is that the platinum group metals that dissolved the easiest are erodium, ruthenium, and iridium. And those metals track one another quite well in terms of its responses to changes in operating conditions, which is why these lines follow one another with the test indices. 
we can look at the results in a bit more detail. Um, I mean, something else that we found, for example, is that sodium and other platinum group metals did not start to leach immediately. There was sort of a lag or a delay before the rhodium started to go into the solution. And there were two reasons for that. The one reason was you had copper sulfide that wanted to dissolve, and there was effectively a competition for the available <coughs> oxygen in the system. And the available oxygen preferentially got used by the copper sulfides that dissolved, and that is why the platinum group metals didn't dissolve, because it also needed oxygen. The second reason was that there's some sort of uh, cementation or ion exchange reaction taking place by which the rhodium precipitates back out as the copper leaches, which also contributed to the fact that we didn't see rhodium leaching during the first X number of minutes in these tests. And that, for example, we could infer because the low pressure test, which indicates the low oxygen conditions, are the tests where we saw a longer delay or a longer dead time in terms of rhodium leaching. So with that information, we were able to develop a reaction mechanism or reaction scheme. We were able to mathematically derive equations to describe the reaction rates. And what we have here, for example, the lines represent the model predicted concentration profiles in the reactor, and the markers represent the actual experimental data. So we had reaction rates that describe the reaction kinetics, and with that, we could do a lot of things. We did eventually achieve the goal of the dynamic model. So here we can see, for example, the dynamic model and describing what would happen at steady state conditions. So for example, percentage rhodium dissolution, percentage copper dissolution as a function of temperature in different stages of the autoclave. And here we can see some sort of a dynamic response predicted by the model where, for example, an increase in the asset flow rate results in a decrease in the copper concentration. And that's quite counterintuitive, but the reason for that is an increase in the asset concentration reduces your oxygen solubility. And that is why we saw that decrease in the copper uh, the solution in that specific leaching stage. The model that was developed be quite, became quite a useful tool um, in our machine learning research group. And I was fortunate to be involved with co-supervision on a number of projects that used this dynamic model to investigate advanced control strategies for the second stage leaching, for process control performance assessment, and for fall detection techniques. So returning to the Lonman base metal refinery, the hydrometallurgical portion of it, this plant then also served as a basis for a number of other projects that happened at the same time or soon after I was busy with my PhD. And this, to a large extent, allowed me to build capacity to gain momentum as an academic and as a researcher. The time that I was busy on my PhD with the second and third stage leaching, the late Alton Taser did quite a lot of work in understanding converter mat. There was a master student, Franz von Skalkweg, who modeled the first stage leaching tanks. So we had a relatively good understanding of how these materials dissolved. But the solution purification remained somewhat problematic. So a number of projects were identified. On the first stage leach, the solution, although we want to produce nickel sulfate, also contained cobalt and iron, which we had to remove. And if we look at our second stage leach, there are impurities such as selenium, tellurium, which could be detrimental to your downstream electro-winning process. So we defined projects around those streams to look at the base metal refinery more holistically or as a whole. And the one project that I perhaps will just talk about a bit more is the idea of the cobalt and iron removal from the leach solution coming from the first stage leach. This is work that was done by a master's student, Marnus Willefier, and we investigated solvent extraction as a method to remove the cobalt and the iron from the nickel stream. So what you will notice here is when we talk about solvent extraction, solvent extraction is basically an organic molecule. And on that organic molecule is a cation, typically hydrogen cation, that can be exchanged with metal ions in solution. So in this case, 
We had an extractant molecule. It reacts with the cobalt. The cobalt moves onto the organic molecule, and it places it in the organic molecule to release the hydrogen cations. That will obviously cause a change in your pH, but the extraction behavior is very pH dependent. So we can see, for example, iron 3 gets extracted almost completely by the time that you reach a pH 2.5 while nickel will only get extracted from a pH 6 upwards. And it's based on that difference in pH that we can then separate these metals. So it's important to control your pH, but if we wanted to neutralize this with, let's say, for example, sodium hydroxide, then we introduce sodium into the system, which again is an undesired effect. So rather what we decided to do was to actually load the extractant with an iron different than hydrogen. And in this case, nickel was the desired iron. So we replace the hydrogen with nickel to have a nickel form of the extractant, and that nickel form of the extractant was then contacted with the cobalt solution, nickel going into solution, which didn't require significant pH adjustments. And this is the flow sheet that was eventually proposed. So we've got this first stage where we loaded our organic with the nickel. The nickel organic was contacted with our leach solution. As the nickel moved from the organic into the solution, the cobalt and iron got extracted, and that produced quite a high purity nickel stream here. Cobalt and iron moving with the organic, and that then got selectively stripped with different acid concentrations. The test work that we did in this case was batch tests, and we used those batch test data to develop process models to predict what can be achieved in a continuous plant, and Ultimately, we had this bench scale continuous solvent extraction circuit running where you can see on the left-hand side is where we did the nickel preloading. So there's our organic in the nickel form. It gets contacted with the leach solution and the cold and iron moves into the organic, giving it this dark blue purplish color. And then in the next stage, we contacted it with acid and that removed your cobalt to leave only the iron. And in the last stage, the iron was removed and regenerated the organic so that this could be recirculated to the start and hence reusing that organic. So this was a project on solvent extraction and as I said, the work that we did for Lonman in this context set the scene for a lot of other projects that also allowed us to apply these techniques in many other contexts. In terms of the second stage lead solution, there are two main challenges with the second stage lead solution. The one is the presence of selenium and tellurium. Okay, so that has got a detrimental effect on your copper electro winning. And the second problem potentially is the presence of platinum group metals. So if you don't operate autoclave at the appropriate conditions, you will leach some rhodium and ruthenium, and that's significant losses. So we want to recover that. And we had two students, James Wanda and Yusuf Bellu that perform tests on these leach solutions to see whether we can improve the operation of those precipitation steps. So at that time, Lonman was using sulfurous acid to precipitate the selenium and tellurium, and it worked well for the selenium and tellurium. But as you can see here, the precipitation of your platinum group metals, such as rhodium and ruthenium, was quite low with the sulfurous acid. And in the test work that James Mwanda did, we tried other reducing agents, such as thiurea, and we found that your precipitation or the recovery of these platinum group metals increases quite substantially. So the work ultimately contributed to identifying potential routes for improving operation and improving PGM recovery in the circuit. The obvious next question is, if we make this process change, what is the downstream effect? So if we look at electro winning, if we replace sulfurous acid with thiorea, Will our electro winning circuit look different? And what is the maximum selenium and tellurium concentration that this electro winning circuit can tolerate? And that led to a master's project by Franklin Gandu, who sort of looked at this work experimentally. More or less at the same time, we also started discussions with Judy Copper in Namibia. And they requested us to start looking at different additives in copper electro winning. Just to give you a bit of context, in copper electro winning, you will typically add something like 
for our gum to make sure that the copper cathodes that you produce are smooth and of a high quality. But the availability of guar gum is seasonal and it became quite expensive, which is why plants like Judy Copper started looking at alternatives such as polyacrylamides. So within that sort of context and framework, we then had three further models, the students Christian Kutsia, Nishlamula Mukawana, and Ivory Masoha that looked at polyacrylamides as additives or smoothing reagents within copper electro-winning circuits. The research in this space consisted of quite fundamental electrochemical tests. So we performed what is called cyclic voltammetry. And what cyclic voltammetry allows you to do is to get an indication of reaction rates at different solution potentials. So at a certain potential, by measuring the equivalent current, it gives you an indication of how fast that reaction takes place. Now, if you start adding things like polyacrylamide or other reagents, those reagents might enhance the rea reaction or it might inhibit the reaction. And if the reactant inhibits the reaction, then the reaction takes place at a slower rate, which means the current that you measure will decrease, and that is known as polarization. And depolarization is exactly the opposite effect. So if the reagent enhances the reaction rate, we will see a higher current being measured. So we did this for our polyacrylamides. And what we saw, for example, is that the polyacrylamide with the lowest molecular weight had the biggest polarization effect. So it inhibited the reactions. The fact that the low molecular weight polyacrylamide resulted in the biggest degree of polarization meant that it had a bigger surface coverage. <coughs> and what was also possible in these electronic tests was quite accurate control or management of the copper deposition time. So these images that you see here, for example, are microscope images of copper deposits taken after 10 seconds of deposition. And we can clearly see the differences in structure depending on the additives that we used. The very high molecular weight uh, additive, for example, we see a deposit that's quite rough and spiky and probably most similar to our base case where there weren't any additives. And in a sense, we could have expected that because our high molecular weight additive was also the additive that had the least polarization effect. The low molecular weight additive, we see a much flatter, much smoother deposit. So we could clearly see the impact of that in our fundamental tests. And then we also wanted to look at it from a more applied or practical perspective. So I had a vacation training student that assisted in designing and building this electro-winning cell. And that allowed us to produce copper cathodes of about 8 to 12 centimeters. And it gave us a better indication of what we can expect to happen in an industrial copper electro-winning circuit. And what we can immediately see if we compare the base case, we can see a lot of nodules, relatively rough surface. Even the GWAR gave us cathodes that were fairly rough. Um, and these nodules is problematic in industrial applications because it causes short circuiting and that leads to inefficiencies in your tank house. So what we really want is the smoother copper cathodes from an efficiency point of view. So quite qualitatively, we can see that the polyacrylamides work quite well. We went further and we quantified the roughness of the surfaces and then just confirmed that our low molecular weight polyacrylamide did indeed lead to the smoothest copper cathodes. The benefit of having done quite a lot of experimental work in electro winning is the fact that we had access to quite a lot of experimental data that could subsequently be used for model development. Um, and here, there was a master student, Manny Tucker, who developed a steady state model to predict what is going to happen in a copper electro winning tank house? And that work was subsequently taken further by PhD students in a Groblar who looked at dynamic modeling of a copper winning uh, tank house. And the basis for this model was an equivalent electrical circuit combined with reaction rate and mass transfer equations, as well as conservation principles to predict what is going to happen in an industrial tank house. These results I've taken from Sunay's PhD dissertation. Uh, 
uh, Sunei went further and she also implemented an online parameter fitting approach which allowed the model to be updated as new data came, became available from the plant. But this just essentially shows how well the model that Sunei developed was able to predict things like potential copper concentration and so forth for real industrial data. And this again creates the opportunity for operating trainer training, process design, process optimization, etc. Right, so with this overview of some projects in primary metal production, I want to move on to metal production from secondary resources. And the first question that I just want you to think about is, when we talk about metal production from secondary resources, why do we do it? Okay, so there's clear financial incentives. In last year, we saw that platinum group metal waste and scrap that was exported to the European Union was in excess of 20 billion rand. So it could potentially add quite a lot from a financial incentive perspective, especially if we consider decreasing ore grades, increasing production costs in our primary metal industry. The second reason is that nationally and internationally, there are quite a strong drive towards sustainability. But despite something like the South African National Development Plan 2030, to this day, there's not a plant that can process printed circuit board waste or lithium ion battery waste. It gets collected, but then it gets shipped overseas. So there's a lost opportunity in terms of local valorization. And then lastly, I think South Africa is actually uniquely positioned in the sense that we've got a rich history of primary metal production. We're sitting with a lot of infrastructure, we're sitting with a lot of expertise that is equally applicable to secondary metal production, and we should use that. Now, when we talk about end-of-life products, it refers to a wide range of equipment and devices, but the reality is waste is quite complex. If you think about even a relatively simple circuit board, there are more than 40 metals present in different alloys and compounds. And it's for that reason that when we talk about secondary resource metal production that we often use a product-centric approach rather than a metal-centric approach as we often do for primary metal production. We've done quite a lot of work on industrial waste such as mine tailings, dumps, furnace dust and so forth, but my discussion today I just want to focus a bit on electronic waste because I think it's something that we can easily relate to and it is one of the fastest growing solid waste streams in South Africa. Now if we talk about waste printed circuit boards as feed material it looks very different than ore but there are clear similarities in the processes so we see the physical preparation of material we see the leaching steps we see the uh, solution purification steps and we see the metal production steps. The main difference is in primary production, we've mostly been working on existing processes, looking at how we can better understand or improve the processes. In secondary metal production, we often need to conceptualize, develop, test the flow sheets because the level of technological maturity in this industry is relatively low. Our work in electronic waste recycling started with the NRF to Tuka grant that I received in 2014. And despite the lack of industry activity in this field at that stage, that position as well from a collaboration perspective. And we were also fortunate that the DSI through its waste roadmap program invested quite a lot of money into this research field from 2015 onwards. So there were approximately seven master's projects that looked at various aspects of a potential flow sheet that would allow us to produce metals from printed circuit board wastes. Our focus shifted slightly towards end-of-life lithium-ion batteries. And here again, you can see similarities between this and the previous flow sheet. So when we talk about end-of-life lithium-ion batteries, we start with a material that could be laptop batteries, it could be batteries from electronic bicycles, and the first step is to physically dismantle that battery so that we get access to the cells. The cells are discharged by putting it in a salt solution. And once the cells have been discharged, 
we can cut it open and recover the anode and the cathode. So the anode is essentially graphite coated onto a copper film. The cathode is the highly valuable lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide that we are interested in and that's coated onto an aluminium foil. So we take this cathode and we want to separate the cathode material from the foil and we do that by submerging it in a solution of sodium hydroxide that selectively dissolves the aluminium and what we are then left with is this cathode material which contains lithium, cobalt, manganese and nickel in relatively high proportions. And our role is then to design the hydrometallurgical circuit that would allow us to recover those metals. There are many different possible process configurations that would allow us to do that. This is one example, and I show the case of citric acid leaching specifically because we had two master students, Sabelo Jeza and Bruce Musaridi, who looked specifically at the system. And I'm not going to talk through all these process steps in detail, but just one or two results. From a leaching perspective, we saw that you can get 95% plus extraction of lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, using relatively low concentrations of citric acid. Right, and that solution then goes through precipitation step, it goes to solvent extraction step where we can extract the manganese and lithium, and that then goes to precipitation step where we produce relatively pure manganese hydroxide, lithium sulfate, and other related products. So our research in lithium ion batteries showed us that it is possible technically to produce relatively high purity metal containing compounds using end-of-life batteries. But we wanted to take the work further in the sense that we wanted to know how do we select processes? If you've got these multiple options, what do we look at? And at the same time, what do we need in South Africa to take these to market? So in 2020, we conceptualized a project where we look at a more interdisciplinary approach. We wanted to combine business case development, reverse logistic network modeling, environmental impact assessment, and technology development in a single project. Uh, Cara Haller, who was a researcher in our group at that stage, assisted with the proposal, and we were successful in granting funding from the Ehrman European Funding uh, Project. And the project then was coordinated as the Eliminate Project, which we coordinated with IEL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, Chalmers University of Technology, Readiness Technical University in Turkey and Exitcom Recycling in Turkey. Now, our Turkish partners were responsible for the technology development, but it was really quite exciting when we saw this project being featured in the Mining Turkey magazine. Um, so here you can see our Turkish partners, and what they were able to achieve is take this process that they've developed in the lab and illustrate it at pilot scale. Um, and here you can see some of the products that they produced at pilot scale using the technology that they've developed as part of this project. On our side, we were responsible for comparing the environmental impact of different hydrometallurgical flow sheets. And this was done by PhD candidate uh, Rulof Maritz. So Rulof modeled nine different hydrometallurgical circuits. And what he found was that all these circuits ultimately have got a net positive contribution from an environmental impact perspective, and that was mostly due to the avoided burden. So the argument here is the fact that we can produce cobalt from a secondary resource is much more environmentally friendly than producing the same amount of cobalt from a primary resource, because you don't need to mine it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And that's essentially what we found. Um, what we also saw is that the precipitation of a mixed NNC product is generally more environmentally friendly than going through, for example, solvent extraction processes. And we also saw that the mineral acid-based processes compared quite favorably to your organic acids. So we had a database, and that could be used in a number of different analyses, looking at different scenarios. The results that we show here simply predicts the environmental impact as a function of your feed composition. So the corner at the top represents pure lithium ion phosphate. The corners at the bottom, that's NMC, nickel manganese cobalt, and that corner is lithium cobalt oxide. And what we see is as the lithium ion phosphate content in your feed increases, the benefit of the process decreases. And if you've got approximately 70% of the lithium ion phosphate in the system, then 
you would actually do environmentally better by doing primary production. So this told us two things. Don't mix lithium-ion phosphate with your other cathode materials and develop a different process for lithium-ion phosphate recycling. Another responsibility of ours in the Eliminate project was modeling and optimization of reverse logistics network. If we think about how these secondary materials enter the system, then there will be collection centers where we as consumers can drop end-of-life devices. Those devices need to go to dismanters where they separate these devices into a plastic fraction, battery fraction, circuit board fraction, glass fraction, etc. And from there it's distributed to the various recyclers. Batteries go to end-of-life lithium processing facility and from there we can distribute products to international and local customers. So, Dominic Voigt, currently a PhD student with supervision from Professor Louis Lowe in the Department of Industrial Engineering, did modeling of these sort of networks. And what they found is essentially in South African context, it's the best to have a single facility located in the Johannesburg region, and that that facility gets scaled up over time as the recycling rates in South Africa improve. And that eventually led to the best possible economic scenario from a net positive value perspective. Having environmental data, having economic data, and combining that then allows us obviously to map these processes and combine that in some sort of metric to identify the processes that's preferable. And as I said before, mixed NMC production with mineral assets generally compare quite favorably. Ladies and gentlemen, with that overview, I, I want to conclude, and, and I think what I can say is hydrometallurgy has played and will continue to play a critically important role in the mining and metals industry in South Africa, both from a primary and secondary perspective. The challenge for us is moving quickly enough, considering the rate at which the characteristics of end-of-life devices change. In terms of further and future research activities, primary metal production, I would really like to expand and improve the dynamic models that we have for processes. And I think there are very interesting and exciting opportunities in the production of critical high technology metals. On the secondary metals side, the key challenge for us is reaching appropriate economy of scale. So currently in South Africa, the risk is simply too high to build a processing facility due to our low recycling rates. So we need to think either about an integrated multi-use processing facility where we can recover value from different factors, fractions at a single facility, or we need to think differently about design for recycling so that it becomes easier and cheaper to recycle. We need to think differently about education of the community to increase recycling rates, etc. When I've done projects, I've often felt that I don't know what to do or what I'm doing. And it is quite daunting, starting with the project, not sort of knowing what to expect. But hopefully the willingness to find out has made some contribution to how we understand hydrometallurgy, how we think about metal production from different resources. As Sarah said, research can only happen when you're supported by people and companies around you. It's impossible to do it on your own. I would like to acknowledge companies, government agencies that have supported my research over the past 15 plus years. During my presentation, you would have heard me giving credit to post-credit researchers, but obviously I cannot name them all in a presentation. It does not mean that the contribution is less meaningful or less important. Um, so to my post-credit students, past and present, each and every one, thank you very much the valuable and special contribution that you've made to the research. To the Faculty of Engineering and its management, thank you very much for creating an environment that's conducive to good research. To my colleagues in the Department of Chemical Engineering, I would like to extend a special word of thanks. It's fantastic to work in a department where there's support, where there's a positive attitude, where there's a positive can-do attitude. And I want to specifically mention our technical and administrative staff members. 
many of these projects would not have been successful if it was not for timely assistance in the laboratory or the workshop, if analytical requirements were not met, or if suppliers were not relentlessly followed up with, or if our postgraduate researchers didn't receive the support that they were receiving. So to you, I really value your contributions, and thank you also for sharing in this event with me tonight. I really do appreciate that. I'm going to step in the trap of naming a couple of individuals, but I think the risk of not doing it is greater. <laughs> um, <coughs> Professor André Berger, he was head of department when I was a final year student. He was head of department when I started lecturing in the department. And even during my undergraduate days already, uh, Prof. Berger always about my progress with key interest always on the lookout for opportunities, wanted to see me develop and grow. And being in the position where I am, presenting an inaugural lecture is in no small part due to his guidance and support. So Andre, thank you very much. To my PhD supervisors, Prof. Stephen Bradshaw, Prof. Kuman Actigan, learned a lot about research, about career in academia from both of them. And to this day, they remain very valuable colleagues in the extractive metallurgy research group. So, Stephen Gubin, thank you very much for your contributions. In his absence, Professor Jock Ekstien, so as I mentioned, Jock Ekstien was at Lonman when I started with my career, and Lonman was a very fond funder of our work, and that created capacity and momentum, which allowed me to continue with my career um, after having done the initial PhD, so in his absence, to Jock Ekstien. And then last but definitely not least, um, to my family and friends who have supported me along this journey. My brother Yaku, streaming from Perth, um, has in many ways paved the way for me. And Yaku, thank you for always watching out for me. My parents, uh, Christy and Charlotte, thank you for sharing this occasion with me. And as I get older, I just realized more and more how fortunate Jaco and I are to have parents who support us, who create opportunities for us, and to learn us about life, not only through words, but mostly through actions. To my wife, Anri, who probably bore most of the brunt of a part-time PhD and general life of an academic, Thank you very much for your love and support, without which this journey would have been much less enjoyable. And then to our two daughters, Imke and Clara, thank you for inspiring me to keep learning, to keep growing, and to appreciate the beautiful things in life. Thank you very much. Colleagues, it is as if we must first pause for a moment to drink in the greatness of what we've witnessed now with two new full professors of Stellenbosch University. Let's give them a next round of applause. <laughs> Colleagues, may I invite both of you to stand with me in front. Acting Dean Celeste, management of the faculty, staff and students, of faculty and other faculties and also other campuses, alumni, emeritus colleagues, societal partners, guests, friends and family of colleagues Sarah and Christy, 
and especially your spouses, Edwin and Anri, and your children. I have a very exciting minute. I must hand over the certificates on behalf of the university. Our two colleagues will henceforth keep on being professors and keep on professing their specific disciplines. And they will do it now with the highest academic rank at the university, namely the rank of full professor. Senate, the main academic decision-making body of the university, has deemed these two colleagues good enough, excellent enough, caring enough, equitable enough, accountable enough to be full professors. And you have heard me quoting the values of the university. All Martis try to be guided and inspired by the five values of the university. We try to embody excellence, and I hope you've seen excellent excellence at work tonight. We try to really be caring, to embody compassion, sympathy, empathy, and even across boundaries, interpathy. We try to embody also the value of accountability. And accountability, you give account of what you're doing. Tonight we see them giving account. They were transparent. They show what they are doing. And transparency feeds truth and truthfulness. It feeds also trust and trustworthiness. The next value of our university is respect. And the word respect is literally to take your spectacles and put it on again. Look again. Think again. Consider again whether you're advancing or violating the dignity, the esteem, the value, the worth of people and of nature. We've seen that also in the two addresses that we listened to tonight. And lastly, the value of equity. Equity from the Latin aquietus literally means equilibrium. We seek societies of equilibrium where some don't have too much and others too little. We're looking for societies, universities, campuses, relationships of fairness. But equity also means that we strive to guard against oversimplification, to guard against extremes, to live with level-headedness, level-heartedness, even level-handedness. To say we're going to deal with complexity, and we heard complexity tonight. But in the end, I must tell the engineers who helped us to see simplicity on the other side of complexity. You really made what you're doing accessible to us, not in oversimplified way, but with simplicity that has a result with complexity. I want to say, colleagues, both of you tonight showed us why every staff survey at this university indicates that one of the things that stands out for staff of this university is that they say there's meaning and purpose in my work. And they energized us tonight. From the moment that they started to speak, I felt, no, man, it's not late afternoon. This is joy, there's energy in the air. Because they know we're doing meaningful work. Your work, your research, and your teaching, you demonstrated tonight, make a transformative and an innovative impact on society. And it's so joyful. I conclude. May I say, Christy, I'm a guy from the Northern Cape. I grew up in a mining town, Lime Acres, Finch Mine, at the time the biggest diamond mine in the world. And I worked there every holiday. 
on that plant. And I think I must go again for some holiday work and just see, oh, this is how it works, the metallurgical processes. I understand it better now. You've empowered me. But you literally showed to us your care for society, and you helped us with an innovative understanding of society tonight. It's not just about the human part, but you were speaking about the natural part of the environment, and you specifically contributed tonight towards our commitment to a circular economy, and you specified as an engineer also, Nico, don't be too idealistic. It will not be completely circular, but we can move closer to it. And then, Sarah, you touched me very much with your focus on inclusive innovation. Tonight, you help us to understand the dignity of so-called marginalized groups, and specifically the idea that they are contributors to innovation, co-creators, business partners, also knowledge producers. For social impact at universities, that is crucial. There's reciprocity, mutuality in our service to society. So my dear professors, it's a big joy to hand over to you your certificates on behalf of Stellenbosch University. Professor Koopman, I'm also supposed to put my spectacles on, but I don't have it, so hopefully my arm is long enough for this. <laughs> um, firstly, so I'm just going to say the thanks. It's going to be less than five minutes, I promise you. Uh, Andre speakers, Sarah Grobelaar and Chrissy Tuflink, thank you for doing what you did tonight. I know it's very, very, very intimidating to come and stand here and do this in front of people like Professor Koopman um, and before your family as well. So well done. We're extremely proud of you too. And then our, our rectorate member, um, Professor uh, Nico Koopman, he's the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Social Impact, Transformation and Personnel. Thank you for making this evening so special and with your kind words at the end. Thank you. <laughs> then corporate communication, uh, and specifically Amira Brown and Cindy Arense for the arrangements. Justin Alberts for recording and live streaming this event. Our coordinator for publications, uh, Jonathan Dalio, a bit late I saw but here at least, Jonathan Dale Blankenberg with the Center for Governance and Function Support, and then the Dean's office staff, specifically Marley, Ulrich and Clint, who had prepared all of this for us tonight, and now I have the very pleasant final words. Please join us for some snacks and drinks in the foyer. <laughs>